Good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. We are so excited to have everyone in house with us this morning. If you are joining us online, we are equally honored and excited to have you as well. Do us a favor. Make sure you drop your name in the comment section so we can interact with you there. Uh, we are just blessed uh, as can be that we have the ability to not only meet in person, but to be able to stream online uh, I'm looking forward to what God is going to do today. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled because this starts my favorite time of year. A lot of people go, okay, October 31st when it's over, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. I am a huge fan of Thanksgiving. And so we are gearing up toward my favorite time of the year. Does it look like I'm a huge fan of Thanksgiving? And so uh, this is just my favorite time of year to be grateful and and thankful for those who we love. And I am so thankful for my church family here in person as well as online. God is going to bless. He's going to have. We're going to have a wonderful service today. He's got. Uh, so many things in store. I wish I knew all of them, but he don't always tell me all the plans, but I know he's got blessings in store for you today. Amen. So I want to make a, another, uh, a couple of real quick announcements before we go into worship this morning. I want to thank everybody uh, once again for all of your faithfulness when it comes to supporting the assembly. Whether you have been sharing what we do online, uh, whether you have been faithful in your giving or letting other people know about what we do here at the Assembly Brookhaven, we are so grateful for your support. Um, just the sad state of affairs in the world today. There's a lot of churches that have really struggled and hurt during this time of, of COVID-19. Our church, we, we've, thanks to your support, we've been making it through. We've been doing really well, and God has been faithful. And so I want to thank each and every one of you, and I want to thank those of you watching online as well for your continued support and partnering with us here at the Assembly. Uh, we're going to have uh, a time of worship coming up here in just a few moments, but I want to remind everybody one more time about the online connection cards. You can go to our website, myassembly.org, and you can fill that out there. Because we are trying to be as touch-free of an environment as possible, we are not passing out our traditional connection cards. So uh, we invite everybody to go to myassembly.org and fill out the online connection card. It's really our best way to continue to connect with you, to share prayer requests and praise reports so we can know what all is going on in your lives at this time. We have some more announcements that are going to be made here in a bit. Uh, uh, Sister Aaron's going to come and going to talk to us about something here, here in a few moments that we can really get excited about. And Pastor has some announcements that we're going to make. But without any further ado... I just want to get in and worship the Lord this morning. I just have, you know, when you have one of those feelings that God's about to do something really good, that's just the feeling I get in this service this morning, that God's about to do something really powerful in this place, and I kind of just want to get out of the way and let it happen. So if you're able, would you join me and stand around the room, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and invite him into this place and into this service. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather in your house, to gather in your name, the house of the Lord, God, and I know that this is a place of power. This is a place of peace. This is a place, God, where you meet with us. Your presence is found here, Lord. And I cannot wait to see what you do in this place as we lift our praise unto you today, God. And as we call upon your name in prayer, Lord, I ask that you would just take us, that you would hide us behind your cross, God, that it would be all about you, King Jesus, that you would be seen, that you would be the focal point, that you would be what we sing about, that you would be what we lift up and acknowledge and glory glorify this morning. Have your will and your way in all that is done, all that is said, and all that is sung. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Worship with us this morning. Washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. There is a light that burns in the dark. 
hope and washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us.
Thank you, Jesus. Fall in this place this morning, Father. Surround us with your presence. We want to 
and our hands to the Lord this morning. Father, we ask you, Lord, to have your way in this service and in our, and in our hearts and our lives, Father. That, Lord, we understand the limitations of flesh and bone. Father, we understand this morning that we struggle as mere humans to understand the awesomeness of the God that we worship to understand the greatness and the awe of your presence. And Lord, would you just remind us this morning that how we see you is so small and so inundated. And God, forgive us where we've tried to put you in a box and we've tried to put you within our status quo and we've tried to build walls around you to limit your moving in our life because we didn't understand it. But God, would you Help us to have faith today to step out of our comfort zone, to step out of those man-made walls that we have built and let the Holy Spirit break out. Break out in our lives, break out in our church, break out in our community and our nation. God, we pray that today. And God, we're believing for your spirit to speak a word that's fresh and alive to us this morning, that we're not here by accident, Father, but we're here for a divine encounter. We're here because the Spirit of the Lord has brought us into this place for such a time as this, and, and Lord, today that you are stirring up spiritual things in our life. God, I pray that as we leave this place, we'll refuse to try to put you in a box any longer in our life. I pray now that, Lord, you would even open our eyes that we're those times that we don't even realize we're doing it, God. It's our second nature. And we don't even realize that what we've tried to do is limit you. We've tried to put you into our, under, our understanding. Father, today, would you grow our faith to a new level? Would you take us as individuals, as Christ followers, as a church to a new level? God, we're hungry. And God, we know we can't do it on our own, but we ask you to do what only the Holy Spirit can do because when you step in the room, everything changes. When you step into the situation, everything becomes transformed. When you, when we have an encounter with you, our lives are forever touched. Father, I pray it today. In the name above all names, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Come on, let's give him some praise in this place this morning. <clears throat> While you're standing, we're going we're gonna to continue with another thought of prayer. We're going to pray for needs that are in this house this morning, needs that are with those of you watching online, if you're, as you're joining this morning, we want to 
Thank you for being here, being in service with us, even though you're watching, whether it's in your living room, your bedroom, your car, maybe in your cubicle at work, but know that the Lord is with you even there. I just love the fact that God's not limited by the boxes. You know, sometimes what I've learned about God is my frustration with God usually is because I try to put him in a box that he won't stay in. Come on. The prophet said it this way. The Lord says through the prophet, he said that my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. For my ways, they are higher than your ways. My thoughts, they are higher than your thoughts. And the day we think that we get our head around God, the day we think we, we know how he's going to respond and what he's going to do, I think the Bible is full of illustrations is that you just got to trust him. You just got to know his character and his heart. And we as people of God, I believe as we draw closer to the return of the Lord, we have to be willing to be instant in moment and in season when God speaks to our life that we are obedient yes. to let God use us in a moment. I, I don't think God is finished using his church, amen? amen? And I believe that God still does signs and wonders and supernatural things through the prayer and through the faith of his people, amen? amen? I believe that God still heals. He's still able to save. He still delivers. I got an email uh, early last week from a young man that's uh, uh, from, from Brian Goldman, who is, is part of the Goldman family, and They've been going through the COVID thing, but many of you don't know that over three months ago, Brian went to Team Challenge. I got a picture of him this week on Facebook, and he's smiling. I showed it to Brother Jim. Never, I don't think I've ever seen, 15 years I've known Brian, I've never seen him smile. I've just always seen him under the, bound, the bondage of addiction. And God is setting him free. Because we serve a God who still is able to set the captive free. Come on. I talked with Tamla the other day, and she's just ecstatic that God is working. They, they've prayed and prayed, and God is just doing a work in, in that young man's life. Just keep praying for him. And so as we pray today, I want to I encourage you. Let's lift up needs. If maybe you've got a need in your life. Just slip a hand up. Look around you today. This is a good time. We're going to pray one for another. Amen. And we're going to pray for needs. There, there, there are those in our church that can't be here because... Either either walking through COVID or maybe they're they are uh, they're health issues. They're afraid of getting out with COVID and whatever the need is. We know that we serve a God is sufficient. The Word says that He supplies all our need according to His riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Jesus is the answer this morning. And so today, as we go to the Lord in prayer, can we just pray and believe? And I just want also as we pray, just. As Rob already said, thank you for your faithfulness and your giving. And since we don't necessarily, we're not receiving offering as we did. Many of you give online. You know there's collection boxes at the door. Um, thank you for your partnership with Convoy of Hope and also with um, um, <clears throat> the Heroes in Uniform. I'll share more with that with you next week. And we had just a, a great turnout with, with that. Those officers are just so just ecstatic about our gratitude during this time to love on them. And, and I'll share more with you. You still can partner with us on that. But we, your giving makes, a, makes all that possible. And we couldn't do that without, without your faithfulness. Thank you. And today we're going to pray. And as we pray, we're going to pray over your giving also, whether it's been given online or whether it's in this house. And we're just going to lift up those needs to the Lord. Because, you know, part of what God does is he's Jehovah Jireh. He's the Lord who provides. He's the Lord who makes the provision. And aren't you glad that, that, that he promises that where, where God, God guides, he provides, that he's able, and you can trust him. I tell you, friend, you can trust. I talked to a guy this week that was just talking about some of the financial hardships he's walked through. He said, but, but he said, I, I started sowing that seed. I was faithful, and as I was faithful, I watched God's faithfulness over and over. You can't outgive God. I'm glad God loves us like that. Let's pray. Father, today we come into your presence. And God, we know that you are a healer and you're a physician. And Lord, we lift up needs to you around this house. We lift up uh, Sister Angela's parents and those who are battling COVID, Lord, and those who are, who are struggling, Lord, with, with different health issues in their body. That even in this place today, 
that, Father, I may not be able to physically put a hand on them, but I know your word says that by your stripes, by the stripes of Jesus Christ, they are healed. And so today, Father, I speak healing over them. I speak the wholeness of God over them, that, Lord, whatever is sick, it be made whole. Whether, Lord, even if it's a cell, whether it's a, a, a hemorrhage, Lord, whether it's a disease, that, Father, it be restored. Father, I pray over those backs right now that there, there be strength in that back, Lord. Lord, there's someone there that I just sense today that, Lord, they're struggling with, with fear in their life. That, Lord, today would you just undergird them with the peace of God, that they would know that you're holding them in the middle of their situation. They've got a big decision setting over their head. And, Lord, today they're, they're, they're kind of in anguish. They're not at peace. But today, Father, would you let peace abound in their heart and their life? Father, today we thank you. And Lord, we thank you that we're able to speak to things that are not as though they were and believe in our heart and have faith that God is able to move mountains and do the miraculous. And we serve a God today who still specializes in the supernatural. God, thank you for working. And Lord, we ask all these things. We ask for provision to be made. We thank you for the gifts that are sown and we ask your blessing over those. We ask for your continued touch upon those who are walking through COVID, those who are in this congregation today, that you would keep them healthy and whole, Father. Father, I pray your best over them today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you. Turn around somebody, wave at them since we're doing contactless Greeting, just let them know you're glad to see them this morning in the house of God. It's good to see every one of you. As we get ready this morning, uh, just a couple of announcements. Just again, I shared a little bit about Heroes in Uniform banquet. Uh, banquet. I'm so used to doing a banquet, but we, as you guys know, we did a gift certificate for them this, this week. And man, they were just so ecstatic, had a great time just delivering those and connecting with them. And we'll have some pictures for you um, next week. If you didn't know, we, we, we were trying to collect $1,300 so that we could um, uh, give each officer and firefighter a uh, $10 gift certificate to Mama Ruby's. And, um, and it wasn't just a blessing to the officers. I, when, I, when I made contact with Jeff across the street, I, I don't know if you know or did any of the timetable, but Jeff across the street, tried to, he, started, he, launched, he opened Mama's Ruby's on, in February. Yeah, somebody already said it. Oh, uh, he opened it in February and then COVID came. And, and so it's just been a journey for him. And so for us to be able to walk in the door, we did this with Mother's Day as well, but be able to walk in the door and say, hey, uh, today we want to buy $1,300 worth of um, tickets or, or at least uh, $1,220. We want to buy that many uh, gift certificates for you, from you. And um, you could just see his eyes lit up because it's a blessing for a small business owner. And so I just tell you, we're making a difference in this community. You're making a difference. So thank you for your help in those projects. And another great thing that we're doing is um, we're going back to our midweek service, but we're going to try something a little different. We need your help with it. We're going to, the schools now, typically um, one of the great assets to midweek service was that as before COVID, youth pastors could go on campus, and, and as a youth pastor, when I was a youth pastor, I would go on campus on Wednesday, and I'd eat lunch with my kids, and then I'd invite them to youth on Wednesday night, and so that was, I had a good chance of getting them there because, you know, you know how kids are. Anybody know have kids? You know how those, you know, got to remind them, remind them, remind them, and so uh, a couple of weeks ago, the school system has decided completely, they had already done this in the county, but even the city, there's no Wednesdays right now. And so we thought while we had this little window between now and the end of the year, we were going to do an experiment. So I need your help with it. We're going to try doing Thursday night services and see how they do. do our, our small groups, what we were doing on Wednesday night, our small group, men, women, small group, our youth, and then our children's small group, we're going to do that on Thursday uh, now until the end of the year. And so we have about six weeks there that we're going to try that and just see how it goes. Is it okay to try things sometimes? Change is not bad. Ask any baby. They like change. <laughs> so we're going to try that. And then one other thing we need your help with this morning is that um, just with all that's going on, we haven't been able to have any kind of fellowship. I just want to see how the body, I wanted to poll the body. And so they're going to put my text. Uh, can, can you do that? I got that a little out of order, Anthony. Can you put my cell number up there, that slide? Give me yay or nay. Can you? 
Oh, is it up there? Oh, it's up there. Oh, I didn't recognize. It was so pretty with all the, tur- all the Thanksgiving stuff, the fall stuff. Thank you. Uh, here, here's what we're doing. I'm just going to do a little survey. That's my cell number up there. And text me. If you're interested, you think you are interested in doing a, a fellowship. You know, we usually do a Thanksgiving fellowship after our morning service, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. If you're interested in being a part of that and you think, yeah, let's do that, I need you to text yes to me. If you say, no, I don't think that's a good idea right now, then I need you to text no to me. And once you've done that, if you say, hey, not only am are you, and I figure this would be the yes people, if you're yes and you're saying, hey, and I'm willing to help too, um, put all, help put stuff together, I need you to text help to me. And so everybody got that? Yes, no, or help to that number on the screen. And if you don't have pastor's cell number, now you do. So uh, that's my number. Now, uh, so I want your help there because what we're trying to do is determine if, if, how you guys feel about us having a thing. I tell you, I miss our fellowships. I do. I was talking to a couple of people this week. I just miss them. I miss us being able to connect together. And I know there's a lot of, there's struggle with that, but there's something about being able to come together and, and just, uh, it's good to worship together, but it's also good just to connect uh, heart to heart. And so, um, um, we may even look at maybe changing the venue. We may look at trying to take it someplace outside and, and instead of being inside. That may be something we throw out there. But we're just trying to see how you feel about that before we work on it and make it happen. We're good? Well, something we do this time of the year, every year, that we're always, uh, that we're always blessed to be a part of is Project Christmas Child. And so I'm going to ask you to watch this video with us. And, and Sister Erin's going to come here in just a moment. The way we express the, the way we express the love of Jesus Christ and the passion that he had is that we go out there and we serve others. We go to the out of bound places, the ends of the earth. The world is changing, but the gospel doesn't change. The message of the cross doesn't change. We're going to make every effort to share the gospel. The world has been decimated by COVID-19. But the work here at Samaritan's Purse, it never stops. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do it through Operation Christmas Child. It's a platform that God has given Samaritan's Purse to share the gospel more than 10 million times every year. Jesus loves you. The wonderment of it is that the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time. From the shoebox to the greatest journey, this is the Great Commission. During this pandemic, during all the fear that COVID-19 has brought to the world, this is when we go out and share the truth. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, going out in the heart of this darkness, the heart of this virus, to go out and to bring up hope of Jesus Christ around the world. Is there a sense of urgency? Yes, there is, because there's kids out there without the knowledge and the hope of Jesus Christ. Get out there to be a part of this. Right now, it's the time. much, Pastor, for letting me talk a little bit about this uh, ministry that is um, really near and dear to my heart. Um, Operation Christmas Child, uh, the shoebox collection provides a box of toys to children all over the world in an effort to introduce Christ to them. And uh, what's really neat about this ministry is that we get to partner with other churches in our area that are also doing the same thing that we're doing, and some of the schools participate. And it's just a really neat thing to do to be able to join with everybody and um, from our Brookhaven area and Lincoln County and the surrounding counties. So thank y'all for um, praying about doing this. Um, Each child receives a Bible study along with the uh, box that we're going to send out. And so they have local believers and missionaries that um, 
talk to the children about Christ and how to have a relationship with him. And I think it's really neat. I don't know if y'all noticed, but on the video, the Bentleys are missionaries that we support. And I think they're in Armenia. I think so, Armenia. And, uh, so they actually got to hand out boxes to children. And that was, that's pretty cool to be a part of that as well as providing the boxes. So our goal this year is gonna be 35 boxes. Last year our goal was 30 and we, uh, we took in 35. So we're hoping that we can even exceed the goal this year. So um, thank you so much for praying about that. The cost for each box is we fill the box with age appropriate gifts and we have those broken down on the paperwork out by the table. Um, we just ask that you add $9 in the box for shipping. Uh, so it would be what you put in the box plus the $9 shipping. And three ways uh, that you can uh, contribute to the ministry is you can actually take a physical box from our table that's provided and fill it and bring it back with the shipping. Or you can choose to pack a virtual box online and you can pack it and pay for it online. And that is SamaritansPurse.org. Or you can choose to give along with your tithe on the pew envelope or online giving and just mark it Samaritan's Purse or um, Operation Christmas Child. And we'll take care of that for you. So our deadline to return our boxes to our church or to do the online giving is November 15th, Sunday, November 15th. Um, Again, and one other important thing I wanted to say about the boxes, it's really sweet to pray over those boxes before they leave your house or your home. Um, and, it, and it's also really precious to have a child that's close to you to go with you to do the shopping because it lets them be a part of it, you know, for them to actually give. And so I encourage you to do that as well. But thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Sister Heron does a great job with that every year and um, coordinating that and putting it together. And, and I love seeing it, it, it growing. So three ways you can be a part, either you can put a box together yourself or you can give money towards putting a box together. Um, again, you can give online or you can give an offering envelope. Um, we'd love for you to make it a part of your Christmas tradition. And I, I really would. I would love for us to double that. I, would I, I, I have a... I hope we could do over 50 boxes this year. I just believe we can. Last year, we kind of got a late start on it, too. So I really believe that this year we're, we're earlier than in the, in the project, give you a couple of weeks to get it done. And it's just a great way to get our mind in the holiday season and, and, and <clears throat> start being thankful about what God has done in our life as we get ready. And so I hope that you'll be a part of that. And um, as she said, you saw our, our AG missionaries. Uh, one great thing about Samaritan Purse, it is a kingdom ministry, and it reaches across denominations. And, and, and one thing that they're doing, they, they supply those and, and will put those resources in the hands of missionaries who fill out the paperwork to request those boxes. And so Tim and Ellie actually use it as one of their uh, open doors to do ministry there, those boxes. Who knows, maybe the same boxes we packed up. I'd like to think of it that way. And they put, put that in a, in a missionary's hand, and they were able to use that box to, to uh, open a door in a family and in the life of a child. So it's just a great opportunity that um, I know you would want to help us be a part of. And so we are in that season of giving. And, and as we step into November, if you didn't look at the calendar this morning, it is the 1st of November, church. Christmas is coming. You're not very excited, but Christmas is coming. And so uh, it's here. How many, how, many does it to, how many of you, be honest, it feels like we just started the year? It just feels like we've just lost it. I told somebody the other day, this ought to be 2020, the year without a Santa Claus, right? I mean, why? He doesn't deserve a Santa Claus. It's been bad. <laughs> when you're bad, you don't get Santa Claus. Come on, we know that. That's the rule. It's been a bad year, but you know what? God is still in control, and this morning, uh, we're going to continue our thought process. I do want to go ahead and put something on your radar screen that I didn't announce earlier, but the first weekend, <clears throat> the first Sunday in December, we're going to have Jason Nobles with us. How many of you got to watch the movie Breakthrough? about the young man, remember it was on the, it was, there, there was on all the t televisions and all the reporting, the young man who fell through, about 12 years old, fell through the ice. He was underwater for over 10 minutes. They pronounced him dead. 
<clears throat> his mom went in and prayed for him and, and, and God raised him up. Uh, he, I mean, God brought him back. He is, uh, I've had the privilege to meet him. He, he is healthy and as any other, uh, of course, now he's about 16 and he's built like a brick house because he plays football. He's a big old boy. But, but, but the, the miracle that God did there, uh, her pastor was, was Pastor Jason Nobles. I just happened to know Jason from children's ministry back in my camp ministry days. And, and I've met Jason back in January. And I said, Jason, I want you to come and share. I want you to come and share a message about how God still works in the supernatural. I, and I, I am, I'm preparing a series through Christmas that Christmas is about miracles. I don't know about you, but Christmas is all about miracles. Oh, the miracle of the virgin birth, the miracle that God would so love the world, he would send his only son. What God was working in the whole process is amazing. So I, I don't know about you, but I hope that you'll be begin to pray. I hope you'll make your plans to be here, invite some people that day. I'm believing God to spur something in our church that will, that will indeed enlighten us and take us to a new spiritual dynamic in our hearts. I believe God wants to move. And I believe God's trying to grow our faith. I think COVID is, is, is a point of part of what we're walking through is, is are we going to get, God is trying to, to cause his church to dig deep in what we believe, to make sure that our spiritual foundations and our roots go deep, that we're just not blowed around by, by, by the turmoil of our society and our culture. Amen? Amen? We've been doing a series on the art of spiritual warfare. And today I'm going to talk to you about body armor. Next week we're going to do a start a small series about why I worship. And we're going to talk about November, about the importance of worship and, and how worship sets us up for the supernatural, how worship causes us to encounter God and why worship is so important to our life. Oh, it's more than just a song. It's far more than a music style or flavor. If you're watching with us online, again, it's awesome to have you with us. If you're a guest in the house this morning, thank you for being here. Assembly fan, can we just give everybody, whether they're online or in the house, just a great big hand clap this morning. Let them know we love them and we appreciate them. And it's good to have you with us this morning. Here's what I know. God wants to speak into our hearts and our life today. And so let's, let's get into God's word. Let's talk about body armor this morning. You see, we've said before that the attack is very real. When we talk about spiritual warfare, we're not talking about something mystic. We're not talking about some facade. We're talking about a very real response that believers have to walk through. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says this warning to believers, to us as a church. He says, be sober-minded. In other words, let your thoughts be very clear on this matter. Be watchful. Be alert. That your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. You have to understand today that there is an adversary who is out. The thief has one mission, that is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he is out looking for an opportunity to work havoc in our life as he can. He wants to detour us from the plan of God. He wants us to, to, to get off track and, and begin to serve ourselves or serve some sinful desire in our life or other than knowing the full plan of God for our life. We said this very own, and this is one of my favorite statements, but a lie believed as a truth will affect you as if it is true. You walk away with anything this morning, you need to walk away with that truth. That a lie believed as a truth will affect you as if it's true. Understand that Satan is the father of lies. The Bible says that if he's talking, he's lying. And understand that anything he whispers in your ear, it is not a truth and it is a lie. But if you believe it, it will affect your life as if it were true. Because you've built your life on that lie. You've built a belief system upon that lie. That's why it's so important that we as believers know the truth of God's word that we understand what God is trying to speak and, and, and the desire that God has for us to be in intimate fellowship and relationship with him. The question can be asked, how do we stand in the face of spiritual threats? If you were honest today and I asked you this question, how would you answer? Does it seem ever seem that you have had more trouble after becoming a Christian than you did before? 
being a Christian. I had somebody come into my office one time. He said, Pastor, I, he said, when I was living for the devil or when I was living in the world, he said, everything was fine. I had, I had money in my pocket and I had beer in my cup. And he said, I had, air, I, had, I had women in my bed. He was just that blunt. He said, but since I've been trying to serve God, everything seems to fall apart. Well, Jesus didn't promise you it was going to be easy. Matter of fact, Jesus said, know that in this world, you're going to have tribulation. See, when you run in the same way as the devil you're not resisting him. But when you start resisting him, when you start making a different choice, when you begin to run a different path, when you begin to go down the path that is straight and narrow, the enemy sees you and he begins to, oh, he, you have a mark on your head. And many of us say, well, I didn't know if I signed up for that. Let me tell you, when we accept Christ as our Savior, you signed up for it. You become an agent of heaven. And the enemy looks at you and says, what can I do to discourage him or her? What can I do to take him or her out? How can I get them to think that this Christianity thing is just a hoax and, the, and that every promise is empty? And he'll come and he'll try to beguile you and lie to you and deceive you. Must we live in fear of attacks of evil? It's a good question. Are we merely defenseless pawns in a cosmic battle waged in spiritual realms. Before I answer that this morning, let me just talk to you. I know that right now there's a lot of fear in our country because of COVID. COVID-19 and you, you look around you everywhere and, and people talk with some level of anxiety. Many live in fear. Our nation, our world is crippled by fear. And I know that, that, that it's a very real, I, I've been there, done that, got a t-shirt. Some of you have the same way. The statistics tell us that, that on, it has a 99% survivability rate. If you're under 70, if you're over 70, it's more dangerous for you. But I know people in that 1% that have not made it. And if you know that too, it, it, it can leave a little anxiety there. I've had cousins, some of you've had friends, some of you've had families. And we live, it's tempting, and there is this overwhelming pressure to live with fear. But you have to understand that fear is one of the most powerful tools of the enemy. Jesus did not give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a, a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And fear cannot control the choices and the actions, and it can't control the way we live our life. If I was to ask you how many of you were afraid of getting the flu and you were afraid for your life that, they, that you would die from the flu, and see, we forget that last year in 2019 that 30, over 34,000 people died with the flu. And listen, this morning, I'm not trying to make a political statement. I'm making a spiritual statement because I'm talking about not living in fear. But we have this idea that when it comes to the flu, we'll take our inoculation, we will practice good health, we eat well. Most of us don't have a problem eating well. Exercise properly, get good rest for our body. And we reasonably expect that if we contract something like the average flu, that we will recover. We may have to take a few days and rest. We may have to take a, few, a little time for our body, but we can bounce back. Can I tell you this morning that Evil attacks us just like germs does. Evil is out there and it attacks our physical body, just our, attacks our spiritual body, just like germs attacks our spiritual body. Now, evil comes from a lot of different sources. I cannot, somebody asked me, said, well, where did you get COVID from? I can't tell you where I got COVID from. There wasn't a little radar that said, -dee 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 -dee. it's him. It was just out there. Chad and I was talking and said, well, it looks like it's going to be more about, not about if you get it, but when you get it. And of course, I tell you again, from walking through it, we know so much more about it than we do now, than we did when we began. And Dr. Beth took great care of me and my family and gave us a long list of stuff to take and, and bounced us back. Thank you, Dr. Beth. Come on, y'all give her a big hand clap. She'll take good care of you too, by the way. 
Because for her, it's more than just a business. It's a ministry. I know her heart. But see, evil comes from many different sources. It, sometimes it's from the choices we make. My sinful desire, my lust, my desire, my greed. And it comes into my life and it begins to grow. Sometimes it's because of the system of this present world. Sometimes it's through satanic messengers, demons, who plant and attack and, and, and bombard us. But we know that we're taking good spiritual health of ourselves and we're, and we're eating God's word daily. We're in his word. We're, we're praying daily. We're in fellowship with other believers. That The reality is that we can resist the assaults of the enemy and we don't have to live in the fear that there's a devil behind every bush or behind every tree. Some people, they live that way. They're controlled by fear. Now, there are times when the attacks are very ferocious. There are times in your life that you'll go through some very uh, intense moments and you have to find prayer support. And I love it when you people tell me, when you write me and say, Pastor, I'm praying for you. I've got your back. And listen, I want you to know that I pray for you every day. There is something of knowing that we're praying and that we enlist prayer support for one another. But we don't have to live in mortal fear of the devil. You see, the... We have to know that God is working in us, that God is bigger than them. One of the first things I, I usually tell students when I'm talking about is that you can't let Hollywood build your view of God's authority over evil. We just finished Halloween. Tons of every channel is, is, is pushing the, the spook fest of Halloween. And, and you know, like I do, it's, it's some demon that always wants to put some little weak preacher in there who comes in and, and he can't have any power. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he that is in me is greater than he that's in the world. The Bible says that you and I have authority to take control over situation. That when we step, wherever our footstep, we have now possessed it for the kingdom of God. And there is power in what we're walking through. You see, God didn't make you a victim. He made you a victor. Things may happen to you, but they do not have to dominate and control your life. God is calling you from being victim to being the victor. And you have to get this today, that God is on your side. At the end of the day, if you hear anything today, know that God is on your side. He is for you and he is not against you. He is not trying to crush you. He is not trying to, to somehow snuff your life out. He is not hoping and waiting for you to mess up so he can judge you and, and, and stomp you on, in the ground and sweep you under a rug somewhere. He is there because he loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die for you that you could be forgiven of sins and have eternal life and know the fullness of God in your life. I I want you to grab that, that God is for you. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, God's for me. Now say it with some confidence because some of you go, God's for me. No, no, say it like you believe it. God's for me. He says in Romans 8, Paul writes and says, we know this for those who love God, that all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, that, that no matter what, comes into our life, whether it's bankruptcy or divorce or COVID, that God uses those things for our good. He didn't cause those things. Understand, those things happen because we're in a fallen, broken world. But we take what the enemy has meant to destroy you, what the enemy has meant to, to annihilate you with and, to, and keep you back and keep you from falling God. And he takes that very thing that the enemy ha had planned and plotted to use to, 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 to snuff you out. And God says, no, 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 I'm going to use it for my glory. I'm going to raise him. I'm going to raise her over it. I've seen some of the most godliest women I've ever met and they, they grew up in, in a childhood in a home where they were molested or sexually abused. And the thing that the enemy meant to destroy their life and destroy every marriage they had, God turned it and used it to be a healing tool in, in his hand to heal hundreds of more women who walked the same journey. He says in 1 John 4, but you belong to God. I, say that just for a minute. I belong to God. I belong to God. 
My dear children, you have already won a victory over those people. Talking about darkness. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit of him that lives in the world. Do you realize the spirit of Christ in you, the spirit of God in you is greater than the darkness that's in this world? And because of that, you have power and authority. He is for you. He is not against you. The word gospel on the screen for you in the Greek literally means the good message. When we talk about the gospel message, we're talking about the good message. The word, you've heard people say, well, he came to preach the gospel. What means that he came to preach the good message. What's the good message? That you no longer have to be judged for your sins. You no longer have to stand before God and be found guilty, but because Jesus died on the cross, that his blood was shed for you, that if you receive the, the, what he did at the cross, that your sins will be forgiven, that you'll be washed clean, and, and, and God doesn't look at you as someone who's riddled with sin, but he sees you washed white as snow. Paul would say he sees you as a new creation, a new creature, that old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die. To die for us while we were still sinners. Think about that for a moment. It wasn't after you accepted God as your Savior. He said, well, I'll pay that price for him. I see he wants relationship. It was while we didn't even know him that Christ died for us. He loves you and I that much. And the greatest defense weapon you and I can have against the attack of the enemy is knowing that God's on our side, knowing that he's not against us. I'll go all the way back to the garden. How did, how did Satan tempt Eve? He got Eve to believe that God didn't have their best at heart. Did God really say this? He said that because he knows the day you eat of the fruit, you'll be like him, and he doesn't want you to be like him. He's keeping something from you. If he loved you like he said he did, he'd want you to have everything, wouldn't he? And all of a sudden, Eve thought maybe God didn't have her best. The enemy's sly. He's crafty. He'll come and work at our mind and he'll use lies and twisting and manipulation. He'll use fear and confusion and it causes us to doubt God's goodness and his love for us. You and I have to learn to shut them off, to silence the voices of the enemy and listen for the voice of truth. Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice. Listen for his voice in the middle of it. I tell you, there's a lot of voices going on with all the politics I mean, you can literally watch one campaign ad and it's, you know, and it's across and, and you can see where senators are competing against each other and, of course, presidential candidates competing against each other and, and want to come on and say this and, and the other want to turn around and flip the same thing and, and you're back and forth and it's, it's real. And let me just stop for a moment and say, I just ask you to do this with me over the next couple of days. Number one, you need to get out and vote on Tuesday. Number two, uh, I think it'd be wise for the church between for us to pray and fast Monday and Tuesday. We need to pray for God's will to be done. We need to pray for the Lord to work and to move. But I'm reminded of this disinformation campaign, and it reminds me of of, of stuff that I read about during World War II when our troops would, at night, you got to remember, this is back in World War II. There wasn't a cell phone. There wasn't any internet to jump on. There wasn't even TVs. Everybody gathered around a radio. And, and, and if some of our soldiers, there would be these big units, these big radios. A lot of people didn't have, radios were not common. It was only, some people would have them. And, and there might be one guy in a platoon would have one. And you're looking, you're miles, thousands of miles away from home. You're looking for some way to connect. And the enemy understood that. And so they came out with a solution. And they, would, they had these radio channels that were full of propaganda. They used names like Tokyo Rose and Axis Sally. And the soldiers would tune in and they would play American music and, and pull them in hearing songs from home and, 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 and stirring their memories and making them homesick. And then they would begin to tell them how that the, the, the American and the British troops could never win, that the, that the, that the Japanese and the, and the Germans were destroying the American forces, 
There was no internet to jump on and see if the front on the, on the, on the north front was doing well or on the south was doing, you, you, you had, all you had was this pipeline of information. And, and back in that day, it was very rare that information got to you and you had no, no, no way to confirm if what they say were saying was true or not. You had to strictly base your belief on what your colonels and generals were speaking to you but they would try to undermine the morale. Can I tell you, Satan works the same way. He'll come with all types of propaganda to undermine your spiritual morale. He'll try to draw you into something that's not true. He'll lie to you to make you doubt God. And listen, when we, when we begin to listen to him, we run the risk of listening and repeating and then agreeing with what he's saying. One more time. The more we listen to him, we run the risk of listening to him and repeating him and then agreeing with what he's saying. And it'll slip out sometimes like, God, I thought you loved me. God, if I'm doing the right thing, why is this so hard? Because he's somewhere in there, there's a seed of doubt that maybe God's not for me. We're talking about how do we win the battle today. And so we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that I know you've looked at many times in the day. Please don't tune out with me, but we're going to look at it real quick in Ephesians chapter 6. I'll read it for you, and then we're going to go through it pretty quick as we get ready. But hear the word of the Lord. Paul writes to the Ephesian church in chapter 10. He says, the final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all the armor so that you you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood and enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news. That's the gospel. So that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts or the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. The first thing I want you to note here is note that as a believer, we have to be active participants with God. Notice the, the, the verbology that Paul uses here. He says, be strong, to put on, to stand firm, to take up, to pray in. All of those are important because they show that you and I, while God is working, we and I have to participate. Neil Anderson said it this way. And if you've never read his book, Bondage Breaker, I recommend that you read it. It's a great read. You may be wondering, If my position in Christ is secure and my protection is found in him, why do I have to be actively involved? Can I just rest in his power and let him protect me? That's like a soldier in the United States Army saying, our country is a major military power. We have advanced weapon systems, planes and missiles and ships. Why should I bother with a helmet? Why post guards and learn to shoot a gun? When the battle is on, guess who's the first one to get picked off? Listen, God has provided the armor. He has won the battle, but you and I have to put on the armor of God so that when the enemy advances, that you and I can push them back in the spirit of the Lord. Look at verse 13 again. Therefore, put on every piece of armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the times of evil. Then after the battle, you will stand Still be standing firm. 14, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. You think about this, Paul is sitting in a prison, or excuse me, Paul's under house arrest. I shouldn't say he's sitting in prison. He's under house arrest. He has appealed to go and speak to Caesar. 
God had birthed in his heart that he would proclaim the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to Caesar himself. And Paul is awaiting this, this appearance before Caesar. And so in, during that time, he is under house arrest. And there are guards that have been assigned to him to watch him day and night. And Paul, sitting across there, he looks at this Roman soldier and he looks at his uniform. And the Holy Spirit begins to stir something in him about how God has given and equipped his saints with an armor to do spiritual warfare. There's a picture on the screen behind me. You can see the Roman soldier. You can see his helmet. You can see his breastplate. You can see the belt, the sash around that holds the breastplate in place. It's up on that belt that the sword is hung, the truth, the sword of the spirit is hung, the he has his shield. He has his lance. His feet are shod with the gospel. He has a leather girdle on to protect him from the blades of the enemy. Paul says, your full armor. The word in the Greek is ponelia, and it means complete. It includes the belt, the shield, the sword, the lance, the helmet, the graves, the breastplate. All of it has to be put on. Paul says, stand your ground. Stand it with the belt of truth and the body armor of righteousness. You see, we are covered by truth and righteousness this morning. Truth and righteousness cover, if, you, if you're dealing with security or you're dealing with uh, personal security, you know, or either first aid, you know that, that this, what we call the torso, contains the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the things you need to live. That if you're shot here, it's a good chance you may lose your life. And so God gives us truth and righteousness to cover these vital organs, to cover our heart. Can I tell you, sometimes the deepest wounds are wounds of the heart, are they not? And that breastplate of righteousness is held in place by a belt of truth. You see, we find great protection in being in reality, being in reality what we profess to be. In other words, that we don't say we're one thing on Sunday and we live like something else through the rest of the week. You see, that's righteousness. The Christian who sings one song in church and sings another song uh, through the week and they live a different way, they're losing a critical piece of their protection because they're not living in truth and righteousness. Anytime that there's a gap between what we preach and what we practice, there's a vulnerable we're vulnerable to the enemy's attack because we give him a gap that he can get into because we're not living what we're professing. We have to do more than talk about godliness and righteousness. We have to walk in it in action, understanding that while we are not saved by good works, we are called to good works which show the glory of God. That's why Paul would write and say, or James would say, you know, he said, you, you show me. He said, I'll show you my faith by my fruit that I bear, by my actions. Dallas Willard says it this way, and I used this a couple of weeks ago. It's still a powerful quote. I wanted you to hear it again. We don't believe something by merely saying we believe it, or even when we believe that we believe it, we believe something when we act as if it were true. Put on Righteousness. Put on righteousness. Know, first of all, that righteousness is not something that you build yourself. It's a gift of God. It's granted to you because of what Jesus did. It's a response to faith because of what he did at the cross. Remember what Jesus prayed in the garden in John 17? The Lord says, protect them from the evil one. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. If the Lord declares it as true, then it's up to you and I to pick it up and to live with it and, to, and that true, put on truth in faith. We have to stand in truth. 
And the core truth is, is knowing who God is and how he relates to us. That you and I have been adopted into his family, that he loves us, he's forgiving us, he reaches out to us with salvation, even though we didn't deserve it. And it's not of our own righteousness that we've built. When we start thinking and putting together our own righteous plan, friend, we build a list of do's and don'ts we can't keep. And we build this false ideal that if I keep this list of do's and don'ts, somehow I have arrived when God's been looking for relationship all alone. God's not looking for a spiritual checkoff list. He's looking for people who are in love with him, who have a relationship, who are passionate about him. Satan will use all kinds of lies to obscure the fact. He'll even use churches and, and people that hurt us and crush us and we wonder and we begin to doubt, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe what God said isn't true. Or maybe there's somebody in your life that, that you've watched and they, they were real spiritual in a moment and you patterned your life. They were maybe your spiritual mentor and then they had a fall and, and it's real easy to, 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 that it knocks the breath out of you. But friend, you gotta realize sometimes we get our eyes on the wrong person. The Bible reminds us that we have to fix our eyes on Jesus that he's the author and the finish of our faith. And when our eyes are on man, man is gonna let you down. Man will deceive you. I heard a young story about a father who called his son in, in a bar one night. And he went into the bar where his son was and he knocked the drink out of his hand. He said, boy, don't you know you'll go to hell? And the father was telling the pastor about it the next morning. He was so concerned and the pastor told him, he said, he said you, you know, you really missed an opportunity. He said, you really, he said, you made him believe that by by one drink, he was condemned to hell. And what you did was give him a picture of an angry God waiting to judge him instead of taking him aside and saying, son, do you understand that the choices you're making, that you're opening a, a deep cavern for your life that will lead to destruction, that has the potential of destroying your life, and invite a conversation to talk about it as a fact instead of saying something that wasn't even an absolute truth. You see, we have to learn to stand in God's righteousness, not our own. You see, our right standing with God is granted as a gift to the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. It's, in, it's an indisputable truth. We have a responsibility to accept God's grace and commit ourselves to holiness. We have, to, uh, we have to submit ourselves to grace and accept it, but then we have, to, we have to commit our life to living holy as he is holy, living for God and living like Jesus because of what he's done inside of us. Does it mean we're perfect? No, 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 we're far from perfect, but understanding that we, we're learning to close the gap so that we don't allow the enemy to get a foothold in our life because why? We want to be more like Jesus. I want to know him more. Was that not what Paul said? That I might know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. So it's important to commit our life to both to living truthfully. May we never live a life that is a lie, that we have this little hidden place in our life, this little hidden sin that we protect. Rob told me a story this week that I thought was so good. I'm going to steal it, Rob. About a lady who got this little bitty python. It was a little snake, and she began to take care of it and, and, and feed it and nurture it. It began to grow, and it got bigger and bigger, and it became a friend, a pet of the family, and, and she began to let it crawl in bed with them, and it would sleep beside her and she would talk about how the snake would would curl up in the stretch out along her back and he would he would sleep all night there with her beside her some of you are already going no 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 <laughs> and all of a sudden one day the he stopped eating 
And she raised him since he was, you can't call him a pup. I don't know what you call little snakes, but she raised him since he was whatever little snakes are. And now he's gone a month without eating, now two months without eating. And she's worried, and she takes him to the vet, and she begins to have the vet check him out, and he looks at him. He, he begins to ask her some questions about this snake, and when did all this start happening? And, and she begins to, to tell how he's not eating and, he, and, and how she's tried to feed him, and he won't, he won't digest any food. And, and he said, well, he, it sounds like he's preparing for, for, for a bigger meal. And then, and then she makes the slip, and she says that, yeah, he, he, he's... he's you know, even he used to sleep with me at nine and he's, he's kind of, he, he just doesn't seem as friendly as he did at one time. And then the doctor said, whoa, just a moment. He sleeps with you? And she said, yeah, and he'll stretch out along and just get into the nicks of my back at night. And he said, ma'am, do you understand what he's doing? There's no problem with your snake. The reason he has stopped eating is he is definitely getting ready for a big meal. And the reason he is stretching out beside you is he is seeing how long, and he's trying to see if he is big enough to digest you yet. Can I tell you, sin works the same way. It'll look very simple at first, but it's the whole time. It's plotting and it's planning because it wants to destroy your life. It's waiting for you to make one mistake and it'll just try to destroy you. And that's why God calls us to holiness. He calls us to righteousness because he knows the destruction. It isn't because God doesn't want us to experience fun. The Bible's clear that sin is, is, is pleasurable for a season, but God knows the, the havoc that it reaps upon hearts and lives. He knows the destruction that it brings into families and marriages and into relationship with children. He knows the, 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 the draining and the, and the brokenness that comes with addiction. And God says, listen, I'm trying to protect you because I love you. But if Satan can get you to believe that God doesn't love you enough to protect you, that he's holding something good back from you, then friend, we'll step into that trap. I've got to hurry. I'm sorry. He says to put on the shoes, verse 15, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news. You can have the most well-equipped soldier, but if he doesn't have the right shoes, he is inadequate. He can't run to the battle. A believer who is in turmoil in his relationships with God and with his relationships with others is not ready for battle. One of the greatest things the devil can do to neutralize you and I is get us fighting within our family units and within our church. How well do you pray when you're fighting with your wife or your husband? You're not, you don't get really spiritual, do you? Don't feel like praying when you're fighting. How many people come, get attracted to a church where the pastor and deacons are fighting a war over a budget? There's, no, there's nothing to draw people there. There's no spirit of grace in the house. There's no desire for, for, for the love of God to abound. You see, we have to understand that Jesus Christ is our peace. He's the prince of peace. He brings peace Number one, between us and God, that no longer we're the enemies of God, but now we are children of God, heirs of salvation, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. And then he brings us peace that we are part of the family of God, that no longer are we strangers and aliens, but now we belong in this family and you're part of this family and I'm part of this family. And together, we're doing life together. When we are ready to fight, ready to, uh, when we, we get ready to fight and we turn viciously on each other, we need to stop and plead for his peace in our life. Listen to what Colossians says. Paul says, make, a, make allowances for each other's faults. He said, what he's saying is look over each other's faults. Believe it or not, that person beside you is not perfect. Your husband's not perfect. Your wife is not perfect. I know, I know there's gasp in the room right now. You're just all in shock. He says, forgive anyone who offends you. He didn't say pick up an offense. He said, lay it down. And he said, then remember that the Lord forgave you. And so you have to forgive others. He said, but above all else, clothe yourself with love. Not revenge, not gossip, 
not retaliation. He said, clothe yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony or unity. What builds a strong church? Love. What builds a strong marriage? Love. What builds a strong family? Love. He said, and and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let his peace rule. His peace comes when we're living in unity and harmony together. Then we have to learn the value of the shield of faith. Faith is not Faith is not mystical. Paul says that by taking up the shield of faith, he says, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Faith is being informed by the Bible about God and his work and his creation. The writers of Hebrew would tell you that faith is the substance of things hoped for, not yet received. That there's a confidence that God's word is true and you stand in his word. You see, the enemy's all about making accusations towards you. He will, uh, tr- he will try to destroy your confidence in God. He'll let bitter thoughts come into your mind to stir up hatred and fire us up. He'll let lustful thoughts come into our mind and, and to try to pervert love for something selfish. He'll let fearful thoughts come into our mind so that we become defensive and self-focused. And what does Jesus tell, what does Paul say? He says that the shield of faith is how we defeat those thoughts. Matter of fact, he says in verse 16 in the NIV, I like the way the NIV says it. He says that we are able to extinguish, extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Anybody in here ever used a CO2 fire extinguisher? One of my favorite ones to use, by the way. I was in a fire brigade at, at a company I worked for, and we had to do all these training. I, I got to hang out with some firefighters on Thursday, and we were talking a little bit about fire safety. And, and, and listen to that word extinguish that, that Paul uses here, the NIV translate. It means able to snuff out. See, today, if I, had a, if I had a CO2 fire extinguisher, and I started to do this for you because I thought you could use the visual, but I couldn't get my hands on the CO2. Because anybody, anybody knows fire extinguishers, there's a big difference between CO2 and a chemical fire extinguisher. We don't want to put off a chemical fire extinguisher in here. CO2 is a little bit more friendly. But if Rob ran at me with a flaming torch, if I had that CO2 fire extinguisher, I don't even have to worry about him. He's never going to get close to me. Because before he even gets near me, I'm going to use that CO2 extinguisher, and it's going to bellow out in a big puff of CO2, and it's going to stiffen and snuff out that fire. Listen, faith is able to snuff out the fiery darts that the enemy tries to hurl at you, those accusations. That's why it's so important to take every thought captive. What Romans says that that, that our minds are transformed, be be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we take every thought captive, we make it submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We extinguish it. We extinguish. But the shield has to be more than the scriptures we hurl back. Those truths have to be integrated into our life. When the truth informs, informs your worldview and it shapes your value system and it takes root, then we know we're ready to move forward. We're healthy. Paul goes on to list the helmet of salvation. And while you may live without an arm and a leg, you don't live and can't live without a head. And he talks about the important, what God put to put on this helmet of knowing who we are in Christ Jesus, knowing that you and I are agents of heaven. And, and, And for us to be able to be an agent of heaven, we have to understand the work of salvation that God is doing in our lives. That, that you and I have been grafted into the family of God. You and I are new creatures. You're not the old person you used to be. Quit living and quit believing the lie. The enemy says, well, it's just the way you are. It's just how you're going to be. we got to come beyond that and understand that God creates a new person in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And 
And salvation is more than just, when we talk about salvation, we tend to think of salvation as being saved from hell. But, saved, but salvation means much more than that. It literally means the larger truth of salvation is restoration to, holy, to wholeness and healing. In other words, that you're sick and poisoned by sin, but God brings healing to our heart. And so we have to put on the helmet of salvation the fact that you and I are saved. Listen, there are going to be some days you don't feel saved, but you've got to stand on God's word and know that you are saved. One more time, you're not going to feel saved. There's days this preacher gets up and I don't feel saved. I don't feel close to God. But once I come out of this book, once I come out of some time in prayer, I know who I am and I know who, what his word says about me. And I stand in faith on the promises of this word, not on what I feel. He goes on to tell us to take up the sword of the Spirit. You got to read your word, you got to pray the word, you got to let the word transform you, you got to live the word out. Ask God to make the word alive and real to you. And can I tell you, that can start by just getting the right translation. If you've got a translation, if you don't do good with the King James, get a new King James. Get an NLT. Get an ESV. Find a version that you can read and comprehend. Seek God through this word. When you go into it, say, God, I want you to show me something about you. That's why I'm here. I want to know you more. If you'll go with a hungry heart, you've got to fill it up. Ephesians 6, 18, Paul tells them, he says, pray in the spirit in all times and every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Notice how Paul ends this. He says, here's what you need to do. You need to make sure that you pray when? Pray when? All the time, always, all occasions. So pray all times, all occasions and pray in all kinds of prayer and requests. And he goes on to say, listen, stay alert. Be persistent in your prayer. Prayer is a protective power that we fail to appreciate in the church. James says it this way. He says, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He goes on to give an illustration about how Elijah prayed and the windows of heaven were shut up. And then he prayed again and the windows of heaven were open. Listen, is he talking about all 24-7 being on your knees? There's nobody can do that. But you can walk around with a prayer in your heart. You can go through your day praying and talking to the Lord and having an intimate relationship with Jesus. So I want to end today. Why don't you go ahead and stand on your feet? God has covered you. God has you. He holds you. He's for you. He's not against you. Look at these truths real quickly. Here's what you got to do. Accept the righteousness of Christ as your own. Believe the truth about God's nature and his love for you. Accept the gift of peace with God and live peacefully with others. Study the word and build a strong shield of faith by integrating the truth of that word into every part of your life. Accept your salvation, God's restoration of wholeness to you that is possible by Christ Jesus alone. And then pray. Paul says it this way, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Bow your head with me this morning. Father, we thank you today for your word. God, your word is truth and it's life to us. And today, Father, whether someone's watching online or they're in this room, you know every heart. And God, you're trying to remind us that you're faithful, that you are for us and not against us. And God, maybe someone here has been a little overwhelmed by the struggles of life. They feel like a failure. They've wrestled with giving up. Maybe they're here today and they're in the battle of their life and today they need to know more about spiritual warfare than they've ever done before. 
Father, today we know this, it starts at the foot of your cross. It starts by inviting you into our situation. It starts by us inviting you into our life. So with every head bowed, every eye closed this morning, I wanna ask you real quick, friend, maybe you're here and you would say, Pastor, today I need to begin a relationship with Jesus for the first time. Maybe you're watching online. You say, I need to ask Christ into my heart. Is that you? If it is, would you just slip a hand to heaven? Amen. Let's pray this prayer. If you raised your hand, you can join with those who raised their hand in this room this morning. Why don't you just pray with me? Dear Jesus, today I ask that you make all things new. I surrender my life to you. I declare that you're my Savior. I believe that you both died and rose again. Now I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer this morning, God's made you a new creature. I want to hear about it. Would you please email us? Would you text message us? Would you let us know? If you're in this room today, before we transition this service and go into a time of worship and close this service out, I want to ask you today, if you need strength in your life, you're fighting a battle, or today you know that there's weak places in your armor, this is a good moment just to surrender to the Lord. I want to pray for you today. I mean, we say, Pastor, there's some things in my life that I need to, I need God's help with. Very generic, but God knows. Come on. I see hands across this building. I want to pray for you today. Father, today, you see every hand that's been raised. You know the hearts that are struggling this morning. You know those who are in battle, those who need encouragement, those who, who have places that the enemy has, strongholds that he has kept, little sins that, that hold us back from being the full potential that you have for us. God, would you remind us today that you are for us? You are not against us. You are setting us up to win, that you love us with all your heart, with all your life that you so loved us, so loved us that you sent your son, Jesus. Father, today, would you give strength and power to my brothers and my sisters that they can walk in victory today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's worship. Let's worship together. Let's leave with a song of victory this morning. Yo! Yeah. 